Reactions continue to pour in following the death of former Steinhoff CEO Marcus Yuster. Yuster died yesterday, a day after the Financial Sector Conduct Authority levied a 475 million rand fine against him for making and publishing false, misleading or deceptive statements about the company. For more, we're joined by Professor Yanni Rousseau, who's a visiting professor at Witz Business School. Prof, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I mean, what do you make of the developments over the past 25 Four hours. Nastasia, good afternoon to the viewers. At the outset, Nastasia, let me uh, sympathize with Mr. Eustace's family, uh, with his wife and with his children, going through a very difficult period, uh, and all my sympathies to them in uh, the current situation and for the days ahead. What I make of the current situation is that Mr. Eustace, Marcus Eustace, understood that the net uh, started closing around him and probably in his own mind, he has reached the end of the road. The one thing I wanted to talk about, I mean, we were talking about how we've reached 30 years of democracy and it's also the 30th anniversary of the first King Report on corporate governance. And I think we did that on February 22nd of this year. And we're now at King 4. Your assessment of the governance industry regulation over that particular period? Well, in short, uh, what we saw at Steinhoff, of course, was a total lack of corporate governance. We had an overbearing CEO that got his way with everything and was not challenged by either other executives in the company or by the people who served on the board of Steinhoff at the time. And that's one of the reasons why this whole fraud could be put together. There was a complete lack of oversight, a complete lack of governance. Having said that, of course, we still don't know exactly what happened at Steinhoff. There was a very expensive PWC report into Steinhoff. It ran into something like 3,000 pages. And therefore, it is now time for the PWC report to be published so that we can get more insight into what exactly happened at Steinhoff and exactly where corporate governance went wrong in Steinhoff. From the conversations you're having and the interactions out there, are you getting a sense that we're getting to a point where we are seeing that stronger corporate governance and accountability? Yes, indeed, and uh, I'm in favor of that. But I must stress, corporate governance is not something that you have in a book on your bookshelf or something that you write many pages about in your annual report of your company. Corporate governance is something that you live on a day-to-day -day basis. Corporate governance implies that even with CEOs with big egos, their decisions, their actions can be challenged. Corporate governance is something that you have to live out in practice every day. It's not something that you report on periodically. How do we, you know, marry those uh, requirements for uh, company corporate governance with a lot of the oversight rules, you know, uh, coming in from Saika and Erba? Because some would say, well, you know, we've had a lot of auditors and accountants in the front line when it comes to some of these uh, collapses in corporate governance or collapses in some listed companies. Yeah, you make a very good point, Nastasha. Uh, indeed, there are many stakeholders in terms of corporate governance, uh, from the clients of the company to the shareholders of a public company, to the board of the company, to the staff members of the company, to the executive management of the company. And of course, corporate governance places obligations on all of these people. My one problem in South Africa is that we do not have sufficient protection for whistleblowers in South Africa whenever frauds uh, come to the fore or whenever corporate governance uh, is not applied properly and there are uh, whistleblowers. Those whistleblowers are not protected. We've seen in South Africa some whistleblowers being shot to keep them silent. So my concern is around the protection of whistleblowers and if we can protect whistleblowers effectively we will get more of them coming to the fore and that will uh, advanced corporate governance. I must also say that uh, it's not as if Steinhoff will be the last fraud ever to be seen in the world. We, we will see something like this somewhere in the future. These things unfortunately happen from time to time in the same way as people misrepresent their qualifications. These things come to the fore from time to time 
Tabi Leoka, most recently people in politics before uh, misrepresenting their qualifications. It's like corporate governance breaches. These things, unfortunately, happen from time to time. One of the things we do see in the asset management industry is uh, analysts interacting with management. And going back to that Steinhoff period, we do admit that not everybody swallowed the Kool-Aid coming out of uh, former CEO Marcus Huster. But how do you then begin by assessing the quality of management without necessarily being too biased? Uh, have you given much thought on that? Uh, let me say, uh, and this is not an advertisement, but I've recently read the excellent book by uh, Neil de Tway on uh, Mr. Whitey Basson, the previous CEO of uh, ShopRite, and Mr. Basson clearly saw something was wrong at Steinhoff and therefore uh, resisted uh, ShopRite being taken into Steinhoff as a subsidiary of that company. So you are quite right that some people saw problems with Steinhoff, and uh, it is easy after the event to say we should have taken more cognizance of such objections, but we have to respect people like Mr. Whitey Basson, who objected to the merger of ShopRite into Steinhoff. A, he didn't trust Marcus Uester. B, he couldn't make sense of the financial statements of Steinhoff. And we have to, uh, we have to respect people that had that insight before the collapse of Stein. Prof, thank you so much uh, for your time this afternoon. That is Professor Yanu Rousseau, who is a visiting professor at Vids Business School. And as mentioned, a lot of people saying, where does this leave the prosecution now, seeing that uh, Marcus Yoster was the axis upon which the case resolved, or rather revolved. And we'll see what happens out of that.